Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 37 of Sir Kevin Says. Today, man, I'm excited. We got Gordon Campbell on what the up, show. What up? How's it going, brother? It's going great. Last time we did a podcast here, yep. we did with Teddy. Teddy Campbell. Yeah, man. My cousin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before we get into it, because there's three people that I know that have the same last name as you. Teddy mm -hmm. Campbell, Warren Campbell, mm -hmm. Gordon Campbell. Yeah. Any relation? No. I don't think so. We haven't really checked deep. We just like Teddy's from Chicago. Yeah. Warren's from here. I'm, I grew up in New York, but my family's from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So that's as far as we've gotten. We joke around and be like, what's up, cousin? It's like a joke, but <laughs> we haven't really gotten deep to yeah. see. Yeah. So we might be. But all know. you three produce, right? Yeah. That's that's funny, man. And that's play so cool. instruments and stuff. Nice, yeah. nice. Well, we'll get into it, man. How's everything going? I know the pandemic's been going on. Yeah, man. With everything going on, it's going cool. Yeah? Yeah. It's some, you know, death in the family and it's death everywhere yes, right now. Yes. So that sucks. I mean, it really yeah. sucks. And um, a couple of my family, like my daughter's aunt, is in the hospital um, with uh, complications from COVID. So, oh, man. So it's real. It's like a real thing. Yeah. But yeah. outside of that, it's I'm good. I hike. <laughs> Anybody that follow me knows yeah. I'm at Runyon Canyon. Yeah. I walk my neighborhood. I walk Woodland Hills up in the hill. I walk, like, if not every day, every other day. I would always see yeah. uh, Cartaya putting Oscar. posts up. Uh, you guys Listen, hiking, like... Runyon Canyon. That's yeah. Runyon. I took them to the stairs, too. There's some stairs in Calabasas. That uh -huh. Crazy. 300 and something stairs, and we do them three or four times up. It's oh crazy. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. you moved out here in 1993. Yep. What's I technically moved here. I got my apartment in 94. I was okay. on tour in 93, and the band I was on tour with, Moved to L.A., so they just had us staying in Oakwood, like, corporate apartments, basically. Got it. So I was here from March to December of 93. We'd be out for a month or two. Whenever we were off, they would bring us back to L.A. Man. So I say 93 because I was here most of the year. Yeah. What about your upbringing? When did you start playing drums? They told me I was five. <laughs> I don't they remember. Told you. I don't know. Something in my eye. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. They told me I was five years old. Yeah. And they have a picture of me with my first little toy kit. And I, there's... um. Well, actually, there's no video when I was that young, but as I was coming up. But they told me I was five years old at my grandfather's church yeah. in Newburgh. Newburgh is um, a city uh, one hour north of Manhattan. Okay. So right. we were in and out of the city all the yeah. time, in and out of Manhattan all the time. Yeah. So I grew up playing in church, and then I started playing in fourth grade in school, taking, you know, actual formal lessons on drums. And okay. All yeah. And what about other instruments? You play keys, right? And organ? I play keys, organ, and bass. Nice. Yeah. Growing up, I mean, it's like most church kids. Like, if you grow up, my grandfather was pastor. All my aunts and uncles play organ wow. on my mom's side. You know, or the majority of them. There was 13 of them. And, like, at least six of them were, like, really fluent keyboard or organist. Yeah. And the rest either sing or direct. You know how it is when yeah. you parent your uh, preacher's kids. You have to do everything, and it's usually the music. So I came up doing that, and then my uncles that were playing stopped coming. And I could play just enough. And they was like, you're going to have to go, you're going to have to play the organ. And I was like, but I don't know how to use the pedals. And they was like, you'll learn. <laughs> and I was probably in seventh, eighth grade, and I just started playing. Nice. Then I wasn't scared no more. Yeah, you know? that's so, cool. But I'm a drummer at heart. You yeah, know? yeah. I'm a drummer at heart that just plays. And then bass, I just, my dad had a guitar in the house, and I started uh, playing it like a bass. Wow, And man. finally somebody sold me a bass, like 100 bucks or something. And that was it. Yeah. When did you get into producing? Well, I started making beats. In high school, because they had a rolling um, 808 in the music room. <laughs> and, you know, we hung in the music room. Like, yeah. anytime, even my lunch, I would get lunch and and eat in the music room. Like, they, they'd be like, don't you have class? So they had a drum machine, and I would always be in the room with it plugged into some little speakers. And I figured out how to use that. So I was always making beats. And then I was teaching the gospel choir, like, vocals and everything. So I was always into teaching the vocals. Wow. And, you know, like that. So, but I first got my MPC after my first tour in 93. Um, Is it pronounced Akai or Aikai? Akai. Akai. Okay, yeah. yeah. Akai. Akai. The 2000? Uh, no, no, no. This is way before that. This is uh, <laughs> the the MPC 60. Wow. That was the original one, the MPC 60 from yeah. um, um, Roger Lynn and um, Bruce Forat. Yeah, Man. so I started the tour. And see, this is way, this is before computers were personal. So yeah. when I was on tour, we were playing over top of program tracks but there was no computer gotcha so the mpc 60 was the brain and then they would get like a kai s 3000s like samplers wow so all the samplers would go into samplers but the controller that you press play on was mpc 60 so on the tour i was like man i gotta get one of those <laughs> so by the time you know i just saved my money from the tour 
And I went and bought one. And there's a guy named Valdez Brantley who was working as Kern, Valdez, Joe Hayward. They were playing with Silk and SWV okay, on the same tour. He would bring the NPC to his hotel room. So he's like, yo, I'm bringing it to the room tonight. Come up. And I would go and he would show me how That's to work crazy. it. So by the time I got home, I went and found somebody with an NPC 60. Man. I never forget. I paid $1,500 for that. Oh, my God. And Before then, endorsements and all that oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I was still back and forth from here to D.C. Yeah. So, yeah, this was 93, beginnings of 94. And, uh, yeah, I would just listen to records. And um, i never forget. It was a record Chucky Booker produced for, um, what's her name? She was married to Ronald Isley uh. back in the day. <laughs> ah, Angela Wimbush. <laughs> Angela Wimbush. And I just loved, I love Chucky Booker anyway. And I just would take songs apart like that one, and I figure out the bass line. I would sequence it, figure out the drum beats, you know, and I would sequence it, figure out the chords, and I just started taking songs apart, and that's how I learned how to make tracks. Wow! And in terms of vocals, because I was teaching choir, you know, I came from church, so I know all the parts, tenor, alto, soprano, and I just started doing it. So I would probably say '94 is when I got my first drum machine. Yeah. Really you know, into it, yeah. Yes, and then I started recording myself. I had like a little Tascam, a cassette tape, a six track. Wow, And I would man. just record myself and all the tracks, and that's how I figured it out. Wait, you said that you were teaching choir. I could sing good enough to teach the parts. Yeah, like harmonies and all that. Yes. Okay. And I hear it. I think I could sing. I just don't. <laughs> I'm a musician. You know, we yeah. don't sing. It's like, but I'm, I'm okay. Like, on my album, I'm singing a couple backgrounds. Oh, nice, So, man. yeah, yeah. So, I can sing, and I... But more so than that, you don't have to be a great singer to to, to produce a singer. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's good, You man. can know the tones that you need. You yep. can know the energy that you need behind that note. And I know the notes. Yeah. So worst case scenario, I'll play the note on the piano. I'll go like, wow. dun, 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 dun. I'll just play it. And they go, oh, okay. That makes sense. So, yeah. That's cool, man. Mm -hmm. Well, for those that don't know, Gordon has worked with a plethora of artists. I actually had to note this down because it's quite a few. I'm oh, not going to name all of them. All right. But Earth, Wind & Fire, George Duke, yeah. Mary J. Blige, Jessica Simpson. You did the American Idol tour. Gerald Albright, Layla Hathaway, Neil, Whitney Houston, Beyonce, Kelly Rowland. The list goes on and on. Yeah. What was your first big break, man? How did you get into the music industry? My first tour was like that 93 thing. It all It's all connected, I guess. But um, a band called Shy, a group called Shy. Uh -huh. It was four guys. We all went to Howard University together. Okay. And um, Chris Dave, the drummer Chris Dave, yeah. we were at Howard together. Oh, he wow. was going to do the Shy gig. They Basically, they put a song out, and then they just kept calling the radio station in D.C. And they and we, on Clubhouse, what I showed you the other yeah. day, Garfield from the group was saying how they just went, they got turned down from every record label, and they just put got the song released. And it was playing on the station. They just kept calling back, and they was telling everybody to call. The song blew up. They needed a band. They came to L.A., and Chris Dave was going to do it. He got men conditioned at the same exact time. Oh, my god! So he was like, man, you're going to have to do Shy. That was a literal words. He said, man, you're going to have to go out with Shy because I'm doing men condition. And I was still in school. I hadn't graduated yet. I had one <laughs> semester left. And um, I left. So oh. that was my break with Shy from Howard. They moved to L.A. They brought us all out here. We rehearsed. This is back in the day. We rehearsed yeah. for like... A month and a half, maybe two months. Yeah. And on our times off or after rehearsal, we had a rental car. We would go to all the jam sessions and just meet people. And people knew us because Shy was big then. They uh, they were triple platinum at the at that moment, which was big back then. Yeah. And everybody's like, yo, that's the dudes from Shy. You want to sit in? I was like, yeah. And I just started meeting all the LA guys. Man. So that was my big break playing with Shy. Um, a friend of mine, Tim Carmen, who was also from D.C., who moved out here. Yeah. He moved here the same time we were out here rehearsing with Shy. Wow. So we were all learning L.A. But he started working with Gerald Albright and Layla Hathaway. And just he worked. He's worked with everybody from Clapton to Gladys Knight, Man. Marcus Miller. And um, he was like, yo, the drummer is leaving the Gerald Albright gig. So after I finished Shy. Jumped onto that. Yes. Man. He basically. And the drummer from Shy that was playing with Gerald and Layla is Lamb Richards who was from Howard, too. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like a whole Howard University connection. Yeah. You know, he was doing... Lan is like one of them under the radar, been, been working for like 40-something years, playing drums with everybody. Gladys, Man. Ben Vereen. I mean, literally everybody. Bobby Caldwell. So he left that gig and was like, well, getting Gordon, he's cool. And I literally sent a videotape to um, Gerald. I had done Arsenio Hall with Shy. Nice. So I sent him that. And we, I think we may have done Jay Leno. So I just sent them because they wanted to see who is this guy. This is before social media. And they hired me. Wow. So I man. literally met Gerald in the lobby of the hotel because he was playing with Whitney Houston. The first show I did with them, 
I met him in the hotel at the in the lobby heading to the gig. Oh my god! And he liked my plan. I guess I was kind of fearless. I I was young and dumb. I was like, "Yo, I'm about to smash." I'm like, <laughs> and I learned the music, and you know, yeah. And Layla Hathaway was on that gig. Gerald and Layla had the same manager, so Got whatever it. gig Gerald had, Layla was part of the package. So I ended up playing with Gerald and Layla. Nice for like man. six years, maybe. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. What's your preparation like? How much time do you have man, to, to no, get? No, ain't no weeks. <laughs> The most organized gig that I've done where I had like a month in advance, yeah. like, all right, we'll start sending the song, is American Idol. Okay. Dave Kochansky was a musical director. Uh -huh. We worked together. We met with George Duke. Okay. But then um, Aaron Spears put me on American Idol because yeah. he was doing it. But um, Dave is super organized. So like a month out, at least a month out, he'll start sending like, all right, here's the first arrangement for this. Here's the sheet music. Most gigs are not like that. Yeah. Most gigs are like, yo, you want to do this gig? All right. Rehearsal start tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So a lot of it is just learning. I listen a lot because before I had a studio, I didn't really have a place. Well, I had it in my house when I bought my house. But yeah. before that, I had an apartment. I didn't have a place to practice. And God, the yeah. youngins probably ain't going to know this. But back in the day, if I wanted to practice, I would go to the musicians union down. It used to be on Vine okay. by Pro Drums in Hollywood. Wow, man. And you can rent a room out for like $5 for like an hour. So I would bring like just 10, you know. One one rack, one floor, yeah, and practice for an hour for ten dollars. But outside of that, I would just listen a lot because there was nowhere to practice. Yeah, and I just used my ears and my memory. And from what I learned in school, I would write out like I call it my little ghetto cheat sheet because <laughs> it's not real notation. It's more like eight bars, and then I might write the groove out. Verse eight bars. Don't forget hit in bar five. Got it. And so I made it a quick thing where I can just write that out. And for whatever reason, when I write it out. It sticks with me. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's how I, most gigs is literally listening, make my little note, and write it out. Smooth jazz is different. They have charts. Most of them have, like, some type of chart. But most of the big pop gigs, yeah, that's you just right. got to listen. Yep, retention. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, be able to remember. And that's what church is good for. Yeah, that's you good. You know, because there's no charts. You exactly. just got to learn. And the yeah. stuff sounds like Chick Corea. <laughs> <laughs> so, the stuff, the pop music is like, oh, that's easy, you know. Yeah. It's more about the feel and the tones. Right. Of your drums, your cymbals, and uh, knowing electronics. Right. Triggers, right? You're yes. Specifically triggers. Yes. Can you talk a well, little bit actually, about that? Well, actually, yeah, triggers and yeah, triggers and pads. Yeah. I don't use that many. If I use a trigger, no, normally it's like kick, snare, trigger. Okay. And the rest I have on pads. Got on it. Like a D Yamaha DTX or something like that. What are some qualities you would say is very important to be able to have as an individual in the music industry? Number one is be professional. And I'm going to say what that says because people say that and they're like, well, what does that yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Professional means, for one, just the way you carry yourself in business. It's still a business. We have fun and music is like you don't have to dress in a suit and stuff. And But it's still a level of professionalism, like being on time, learning the music before rehearsal, coming prepared, being early for the drummer so you're on time. Yeah. And I'm guilty of that a lot. I'm <laughs> I'm like, wait till the last minute. Okay. And then it's traffic in LA. Right. So, but I know it's like, all right, if it's something that I, I got to leave at least two hours or hour and a half early so I can get there at least 45 to 30 minutes early to set up and everything. Even when I have a drum tech, I still got to make sure someone, if they say 12, at 12, I'm sitting down ready to count the first song off. Man. So being on time, learning your music. Um just being a good person to be around. Because I, I was saying this on, a, on another interview the other day. When you're on tour, or even if you're in the studio, majority of your time is hanging out. It's not mm. playing. When we're on tour, we might be on stage for two hours. Right. Or an hour and a half. The rest of the day, <laughs> you're just around people. Yeah. Or even if you're by yourself, it's like you have to be personal. A personable person. You right. You know what I mean? To yeah. be around. Because if not, it doesn't matter how good you play. If you're a butt to be around, nobody wants to be around you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, somebody even said hygiene the other day. I was like, yeah, you can't smell like you can't stink because nobody wants to be around a stinky person. Right. Right. So it's just like any other job. You got to be on point. You got to know what you're doing. You can't half step, you know, and really learn the music. And I always tell like the students I teach. Learn the history of music in general, but definitely learn the history of your instrument like drummers. I shouldn't walk up to any drummer. They don't know who Buddy Rich they don't know who Dennis Chambers. They don't know who Gad. Yep. They don't know who Elvin Jones. Taliuda. Vinny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, if you don't know who they are, I wouldn't say you can't play because there's some people that just can play. Right. But in general, I'd be like, oh, man. <laughs> you know, it really helps knowing history of your instrument and just music in general. 
and knowing where it came from and not thinking that you're the first person that came up with this lick. Right. It's like, bro, you know, when I show, I hear something, I'll show one of my students, like an old Vinny thing or an old dentist. They was like, that's the same lick. I'm like, I know. <laughs> I don't always say it out loud because you want to be that know-it-all or you hating on the young guys. But it's like, it's nothing new under the sun. Yeah, that's good, man. You know? That's good. So knowing history helps you do that. And it, and it helps you learn music, too. It's a song that I used that Calvin Rogers played on, a Marvin Sapp song called Magnify Him. Oh. It's just a go-go beat. But, like, my students, some of my students never heard of go-go music. That rhythm is... So the hi-hat is actually in go-go music. If you know what go-go is, that's the cowbell pattern. Got it. And the kick drum and that red, the kick and snare pattern, that's a normal go-go beat. So if you know go-go, once you hear that, it's like, oh, okay. So if I have to play that, I just know it's a go-go beat. Yeah. But if you never heard of go-go, if you don't know that history, right. you'll just be like trying to figure out what he played. Yeah. So I think knowing history and knowing different styles of music, it helps you when you're learning, listening to somebody else. It helps you analyze what they're playing. Yeah. Which is half our job. What's your relationship, I guess, the love and hate relationship between Gospel Chops and Pocket? I think Gospel Chops has a bad stigma. <laughs> and it's a couple things I learned, especially during the pandemic. Like, you really, because all we have is, like, either a Zoom right. or, like, a clubhouse, people really make judgments super quick off of people. They don't, like, sit back and, like, observe. They just see you do one thing. Like, if somebody walked in here and I was playing tambourine, in their mind, I'm a tambourine player, and that's it. I can't do mm. nothing else. Or So it's like... You get pigeonholed super yeah. fast. People watch that, and if they've never been to church or they don't listen ah. to gospel music, they think that that's all gospel is. So that's an element of gospel. Yeah. So I have, because I teach a gospel class at MI, mm -hmm. I have my students come to church. And our pit, I'm like, there's extra chairs. Just come sit in the pit and watch what we do. My whole class and, and the gospel, because they come in thinking that we're going to be doing gospel chops. And then I'll play Don't Wait Till the Battle's Over, Joel Smith, or I'll play um, Should Have Been Me. Could have been me, uh, Kirk Franklin, with Terry Baker yeah. on the drum. And it's, I said, did you hear a lick in there? No, we just heard some feels. It's like, exactly. Gospel is about feel and pocket. Yeah. It's not chops. That's just one element right. that we've all used. But because that's what was shown on those videos, the average person, especially around the world, thinks that's gospel. Hmm. I'm like, bro, I've been playing in church. I'm 49. I don't think I've ever taken a solo in church. So <laughs> all of those chops might fit in a song somewhere. Right. But I'm not soloing at church, so that's not – people just got the wrong idea of what gospel chops is. So that's the only reason I look down when I hear that word. Yeah. And then they think you don't have pocket because that's all you do. Right. That's where the pigeonhole comes in. If they see you playing that, they assume you can't play anything else. Yeah. And I think that's not cool. Yeah. So it kind of gave us a bad name. But I think it's changing a little bit now. And there's some young guys that I see, man, that are playing the music. They got chops, but they're really – hearing and listening to music and understanding that there's a place for that and then there's a time to turn that off yeah and play the song and some songs require both you play the pocket and there's a spot and that's where you take that, that spot that's good you know so. that's good so it's love hate because i think people interpret it wrong and they think that's all it's about even gospel drummers young drummers mm. they think that's what makes them dope wow. i'm like yeah but you ain't really gigging i said all and this is what i always say all of your favorite drummers with the most chops and I can name some, like Aaron Spears, Eric Moore, Ronald Bruner, um, Mike Mitchell. They got all them chops. But when you see them playing on the gig where they're making some money, yeah. they're, they're not, not doing, doing that. that. <laughs> yeah. They have this expertise to know when to turn it off. Right. But for video, for social media, all right, this is going to, you know, not even for likes. That's that's their style. Yeah. But they don't use all of that when they're playing a gig. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You might need it to pull it out. You you always want to have more than you need. So when the MD or the artist looks at you and like, yo, it's your time. Yeah. You want to you don't want to be like, uh, you want to have them chops. Yeah. But most of the gigs that we're doing is pop music. People not dancing to chops, they dance right. into a groove. Yeah, that's good, man. So that yeah. to me that's what it is. Yeah. What would you define as a great drummer? Oh man, it's so much <laughs> into that. Uh a great drummer is a great musician. I have to say that. You got to be a musician first. It's about the music. Like, yeah. we cater to the music. Most of the times, nine times out of ten, we're the accompaniment for either a, somebody playing a melody or a singer. So being a, being a full-on musician is playing catering to the music. Yeah. And 
I don't know if you know about my DVD. This is a shameless plug. It's old now. Secrets of the Working Drummer. Yes, of course. That's what I talk about. This is the secrets that we need. What's important is being able to listen, being able to make it feel right. And the feel is everything. Like it, You can be playing technically perfect, but if it don't feel right or it feels mm-hmm. stiff, then it's defeating the purpose. Like I'd rather have a drummer with no chops that feel as crazy. Like Stevie Wonder, for instance, playing on, like, on Stevie Wonder albums. Yes. He's not a drummer, but I like the feel. So to me, Man. you know, knowing how to make it feel good, knowing how to cross genres, and just being a musical person, like when it's soft, you play soft. When it's loud, like just not dynamics in. and all Dyna- that. Yeah, yeah, and that's any musician, not yeah. just drums, but because you asked me drums, yeah. Man. And, and I really think just understanding dynamics, feel, style, genres, all of that stuff, you know. Yeah. And and the thing is, as musicians, we tend to. Um, we learn a certain way and we stay in this box. And if it's anything outside of the box, we don't like it or that's wrong. To me, there's no wrong. It's just music, whatever. But if I feel like, and they're singing soft, I might feel like going, bat <laughs> like that on purpose. You know what I'm saying? So that's out. They can, you can't play loud if they're singing. Th- there's really no rule. There's rules, right. but there's really no rules. Yeah. So, but for me, I feel like I know enough to where I could break the rules sometime and I'm breaking it on purpose. Yeah. You know, as long as you kind of know the rules, for each style, you can, whatever your heart tells you to do at that moment, you know, and sometimes it's good if you don't know any rules because you're just playing from your heart and your feel. And that's really what music is about. It's yeah. like getting out what's in your body. Right. And right. it's not always hokey or like in exactly. a box. Yeah. You know, exactly. yeah. so I think what makes, yeah, I think that's what makes a good drummer really being a good musician. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Who would you say are some people that continue to inspire you? Quincy Jones. Off the top of my head. Oh, man. Yeah. Quincy. Legendary. Marcus. Yeah. Because as a producer, as just a musician and a lover of music, like he's covered every spectrum. Yes. <laughs> From yeah. Sinatra to Thriller. You know what I'm saying? His it's documentary like, on Netflix whew, was incredible, I man. watch it at least once a month. Wow, I watch man. it over, I, more than 10 times I've watched it. You've had the chance to work with Quincy? Never. I just met him around because he, if he's out, he hangs. Like if you ever at a, any event, yeah. like he was at a jam card event. I did a, a a party at Tyler Perry's house okay. three or four years ago, and he was there, and he was sitting there with um, Cicely Tyson oh my by the gosh. pool, and it's like 2 in the morning. <laughs> like it was, And I just sat there and just started talking to him. It was funny. Yeah. I'm like, I'm a big fan. He was like, yeah, can you give me a glass of wine? <laughs> sure. And Cicely Tyson was like, cute. <laughs> like, that's rude. I was like, bro, I'll do whatever you want. You want me to wash your feet? You're... You know, so I've met him in those situations. I don't know him. Like, I don't yeah. think he know me. But, yeah, he, him, I love Marcus. Like, Marcus is probably, like, the GOAT in terms of what I want to do career-wise, and I'm still working at it. He's produced super huge hit records in jazz and in R&B mm. and in pop, and he's still a killing bass player, yeah. and he's an artist. So he works as an artist. He's doing movie scores. He's literally, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Outside of playing, now I have my album out, so now I'm moving into artistry. So now when we're, it's open, I'm going to start playing with my band. But I want to produce, you know, I don't know if you know, Marcus did like Never Too Much for yes. Luther and House Is Not A Home. He told us this himself. Um, basically, whenever he was playing, he always want to put something in that you know it's him. Yeah. You know, like that, bang, that pluck or something. And it's like, yeah, that's Marcus. <laughs> like, so it would always be something that he would do almost on purpose that people would know that it was him. Yeah. And he would just, he said he would just put tracks together and send it to Luther. And it was one that he said, um, he sent to Luther and I guess he wanted to get a blue Porsche or something like that. And when, <laughs> once Luther wrote to the track, he said, he called him was like, yo, get ready to order your blue Porsche. Oh I just wrote a hit. Gosh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He's actually told, it was me. I was playing with DW3 on one of these cruises. Yeah. And he was just sitting in the room talking and we were like, yes. <laughs> but yeah, he's done everything from Luther to, Miles Davis mm-hmm. Tutu to Joe Sample. Like, yeah. those are albums that I grew up listening to. And then he produced and played on all of them. And he's an artist. It's like he's done the whole scope. Right. And he does movie uh, scores. So like he literally, that's like, man, where I, that's my ideal. Yeah. And he's rich. I want to make some money. <laughs> so, yeah. But, man. um, it's, man, it's so many people yeah. in so many genres. Like, Dennis was like always one of my idols, Dennis Chambers. Yes, of course. Um, Man, it's, it's 
It's yeah. so many different. You can go people. in so many different directions. Yeah, with this. from yeah. the production tip, I just like a lot of producers. Yeah, I like I've like love Timberland. I love this dude named Camper that's around now. JD Camper, that's dope. Who did who uh, did hers? Okay. Um, record in Brandy's new album, and who else? There's a guy here named Harmony Samuels that's dope. Um, on the gospel, like Aaron Lindsay. Yes. Um, playing wise, I love this kid named um, Josiah Maddox and Lacey Comer. Josiah is dope on keys and yeah. drums. Lacey too. And every, all the guys that I like really play different. In, they yeah. all play multiple instruments, right. so it just makes them like this super human almost. Yeah. Um, and then all my homies, like like drum wise, like Gerald Hayward. Um, I've been watching him since I was a kid because he's from Brooklyn and I'm from New York. Yeah. And all our churches fellowship together, so I watch him, you know, for years. Like Aaron Spears, of course, um, Nissan Stewart, Chris Johnson, mm. Calvin Rogers, Teddy, yeah. Teddy yeah. Campbell. Yeah, like, man. man, it's so many of the homies know, that's man. killing. It's like, I feel bad because I can't remember them all. Sput C. Wright yep. is like my bro, Doobie Powell is like my bro. Like, a lot of us grew up Church of God in Christ, so we've been knowing each other since we were kids, like yeah. going to conventions, and we would always be around the drums, like hanging around, like man. we would bring our stick bag and be mm-hmm. walking around the conventions, like just waiting for a chance to play. So we literally been knowing each other almost 40 years. Man, that's incredible. Yeah, since we were little kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How important has faith played a part in your journey? Faith is everything, man. Literally, like just the room that we're in right now is like, I didn't necessarily have enough money to pay for this room when I got mm-hmm. it. You know, it's expensive. It's more than my mortgage for my house each month with no steady gig. And when right. I got this room, I had decided to quit touring. I had done American Idol, and then I did uh, Philip Phillips, who won Idol the year before. Yeah. He was out with J- John Mayer. So 2013, I was playing with American Idol and Philip. I was going back and forth. And I was like, I ain't touring no more. I'm over it. Like, I need to do And I wanted to produce. So the fact that I got this room, I was just like, yeah, start making it happen. God, yeah. uh, yes, I, that's faith, because I have enough space in my house to put this in there. You know, I had it set up in my house for years, but I was like, I need to be more professional. I need to look a certain way to get the production that I want, and I need to be in North Hollywood or in the area where everybody's at. Exactly. You know, yeah. so faith is everything. Like that's what we're built on. I mean, that's how we got through the pandemic. That's how everything. Yeah. Yeah, without that, we'd be swole. Yeah. And there's still some days I'm like, all right, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this, but faith is the only thing. Like, all right, I'm going to close my eyes tomorrow. Hopefully I'll wake up and I'm going to just do what I got to do. Yeah. So, yeah, that's everything. How long have you been at your church? Faithful? Yeah. Hmm. 20 years? 20 years. Yeah. Maybe 21. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I started filling in, I think it was 1999. Did somebody invite you to the church? Yeah, or? and I played organ. That's the funny thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, Bishop Omer, I play at Faithful Central. Bishop Omer had gone to Chicago, and he brought the choir and the whole band. So they were scrounging to just find a few people to fill in in L.A. Um, they had some people because most of the – we have, like, two of almost everything at the church for different services. Yeah. So they had – but they didn't have nobody on organ. And Sekou Bunch called, like, yo, what are you doing um, tomorrow? I was like, nothing. You want to play organ at church? I'm like, all right. You know, I need the money. It's Faithful Central. Here's the address. So I went down. It was a Saturday, and I was at the um, shop get my Honda fixed, my car fixed. And I just, once it was fixed, I drove down to Faithful, met the people, and I played a guy named Donald Taylor, who had a choir called L.A. Mass Choir. Okay. Stayed home. So he was directing the choir that day. So afterwards, he came and was like, thank you for filling in on organ and whatever. And Sekou goes, he's really a drummer. Like, you got to hear him on drums. (laughs) Yeah. And he was like, oh, okay. I'm going to have to get you to fill in. So they start calling me to fill in. And then maybe, actually a couple times, he was like, yo, you need to play here. And I was like, nah, I don't want to play at church regularly. I've been playing at church my entire life. Yeah, yeah. In Howard, in D.C., and in, in New York. I was like, I'm cool. I'll fill in when you need me. Come on, man. So the drummer, who was a friend of mine, there was two drummers. The second drummer... The guy Donald calls him like, yo, you know, I need you to do this. I'm, I'm like, what? And I probably shouldn't say this. He was about to get let go. Okay. And I was like, no, nah, that's the homie. Like, no. He said, no, he's out if you come or not. So oh. so at that point, I was like, well, if you put it like that, all yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, and that probably was 2000 or 2001. And I've been playing there ever since. Oh, man. Yeah. Long story, longer. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I've been playing there ever since. But I started, I played organ the first time. But that church, they take care of us. Like, they're cool. A lot of churches, if you go on tour, they'll fire you. I've been gone for a year, 
And long as you got a sub. You're good. Yeah. Yeah. They're calling you like, when you coming back? We miss you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They get it. And that's, and actually bishops, the whole church's thing is building champions for divine deployment, which means we're building you so you can go out in the industry. They're not saying don't go out wow. in the industry. Don't. No, we're supposed to be out there and be in a light in front of people. Yeah. So they, they welcome that. They're cool with that. Long as it's a sub and long as you don't, not neglectful, somebody's there to fill that spot. Maintaining your testimony. Mm -hmm. How important is that to you? Yeah, man, for me, it's just my life. Like, I don't think about it. I just am. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I heard Teddy say this one time, like, somebody asked, how do you play secular music? And, like, people that's in the gospel or in, in the Christian scene yeah. have a certain idea of what it is to be on the road. I've actually seen worse playing gospel gigs than I do when I'm playing, man. like, R&B, pop, or just secular, what they would call secular. It's business. Like, you do what you're supposed to do on stage and when the gig is over you do what you would probably do at home anyway if it's smoke or drink you're going to smoke there you probably do at home anyway mm. so it doesn't matter who you're playing with you're going to do what you do so but the thing is just doing you whatever you and you feel comfortable and for me i do some stuff but i have a moral compass because i grew up with yeah. it so i ain't going out too far <laughs> you know yeah. so yeah. i'm a chill so but i just am me and it's funny because i don't think about it but people are like, bro, you've been the same ever since I met you. Like, you super consistent, <laughs> consistent yeah. and whatever you. And I was like, because I'm not faking or I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm mm -hmm. just doing me, trying yeah. to pay my bills, trying to play some good music and have some fun. Yeah. So that that's how I look at it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Any other passions? Maybe I like not related walk. to me. <laughs> you like hiking? <laughs> yeah, I do. Honestly, it's like, I don't know if that would be considered a passion. Like, I just, I'm getting older. I'm 49. Yeah. So it's like, yeah diabetes and stuff i don't want to have it <laughs> so yeah. it's like and if i don't i gotta stay in shape and i still eat but walking balances it out you yeah know? so and i do a cleanse like i'm about to do one now a 20 day like no cooked foods is it like raw. the daniel fast Are you doing something it's similar? actually like that but it's not it's called <laughs> d herbs so okay. i usually coincide because yeah. our church is doing that now they just started last week and i'm not i haven't done it so because i know i'm gonna do my cleanse so i kind of do all that i cleanse myself from all of that I kind of fall back from social media. Yeah. I do that twice a year. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's 20 days. It's called D-Herbs. It's actually a black-owned company in Atwater Village. Yeah. And um, it's 30 pills a day <laughs> and a gallon of water a day. Oh, my but God. But it's like, and no cooked foods for 20 days. It's all fruits and vegetables for 20 days. Oh, man. But I lose weight. Whatever is going on in my body, like, clears up. The toxins come out. And I feel better. And then I put them back on. Sorry. <laughs> I tried it, but it's like a restart. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. once I'm done, I'll go a good couple of months where I'm like really just restarting my body. And I'm still trying to find that space where I can just eat like that all the time. Yeah. I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. So I fall back. But if I do it twice a year, it restarts my body. Like, That's cool. Yeah. That's great. That's great. What are some things that you would teach if you could mm -hmm. curriculum wise that isn't taught in the school now? I got a whole nother thing that I'm going to talk about in two seconds. Go ahead. But what I do teach at the school, and I think it's kind of cool because I did. I used to do clinics at MI, and the chair of the drum department was like, do you want to teach here? I think he liked the way, like, as I'm talking to kids and shaking hands at the end of my clinic, he, like, went through them like, dude, do you want to teach? I think he liked the way I, what I try to teach is practical application before we get to anything outside of music. I think we learn a lot of, um, technical stuff yeah. in school. And even me, when I was at Howard, I was so focused on technique. I went back home to New York and played, and it was like, man, you you lost your funk. Like, what happened? Because I was focused on technique. Mm. So what I try to teach the kids, because they're getting a lot of technique, and that's super important, is practical application. Okay. I'm like, if Christina Aguilera called you today and you got to show up tomorrow, you need to know what you need in your mix. You need to know how to listen to a song, because it's probably not a chart. How to listen to a song and basically analyze it, interpret it, make it feel like the record, make it sound. Those basic practical applications, I don't think it's taught all the time. So yeah. that's what I teach. Like my privates, we don't go through books unless they ha want have a book they want to go through. No, I'm like, listen to this. Now tell me what you hear. What's the kick pattern? What's the hi-hat pattern? And then I'll shake them up. Like, what was the bass player playing right there? And they'd be like, huh? Like, they didn't even think about that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. playing live, you got to play with the bass player. Right. You got to play with the keyboard. You got to lock in. All the parts are interlocked. Mm -hmm. And that's it tells you where you need to be on the drums. So that's my thing. I teach practical application. 
Now, on the other side, talking about taxes, health and wealth and how to make a career out of it. I'm in a group called the National Black Musicians Coalition. Okay. We started after George Floyd was killed. Sput called us on a Zoom, like, yo, get on the Zoom. And it was like 60 musicians, like all the top guys that you know, everybody was on there. Wow. And we were just talking about everything going on. And it really started talking about our endorsers not really saying much. And they want to make statements. And now they're hitting us up. What should we say? Because they're not, they don't have a lot of black people. So another group that I'm in with something else, a guy named Chip Sheeran was like, yo, we need to get all the black musicians, black musicians together and start talking about this. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, we've been talking with Sput for the last week. The first call we were on for four hours. It was like 60 people for four hours just talking. Wow. And um, so Chip came in and we started talking and we ended up starting a 501c3. And now it's called National Black Musicians Coalition. I think I saw Lil John Roberts post something yes. about it. Yeah. The board is it's 12 people. It's Chris Johnson, Aaron Spears, Nissan Stewart, Chip Sheeran, Cora Coleman, Kat Dyson, Divinity Rocks, Dave Hampton, Emmy Parker, me, Sput, and who's the last person? I'm missing somebody. It's 12 people. I can't think it's 12 of us, but <laughs> yeah. we're the board of directors, and then we have a whole nother group that's joining now. It's going to be, right now, it might be about 100 or something, all the top musicians. And we get on Zooms and we talk, and now we're meeting with the companies, the heads of like Zildjian, Fender, and they're coming to us like, what can we do? We want to give back since the whole, you know, everybody's woke now. And one of the things we're taught we're going to have to start doing is – um. We're going to be doing workshops. We did one already where we just had a question Q&A. Yeah. We had a Zoom. It was people from Africa. Like all these, like a whole crew of cats from Africa were on there asking questions. But we're talking about health and wellness. We're talking about education. We're talking Man, about money, finances. That's amazing. Yeah. And that's one of my passions is giving back to the youth. So to get back to your other question, it hit me. Like I really like paying it forward. So all the time I don't say stuff because if you talk too much, people either think you're a know-it-all or you're hating when you tell a musician, don't do that because that or – so I kind of fall back. But I really like teaching young people. I like giving back. Yeah. So that's a passion and that's, yes, some of the stuff that we need to teach. And even with my 19-year-old daughter, sometimes, you know, they don't always want to hear it. But I'm like, listen, I wish somebody would have told me to invest when I was touring a lot, making a lot of money. They did tell me buy a house and I bought my <laughs> house. and it, I've been in there 21 years wow. now. So instead of buying a bunch of cars and stuff – I bought my house. I had a Honda, and I still kept it for years. Man. You know, then I finally was able to get what I wanted to get later. But I was in my house probably five years before I got a Mercedes. You know what I'm saying? Wow. I didn't just, yeah. you know, so they told me that. But in terms of, like, investing in something, I didn't really know. Now I know. So now I'm trying to t teach that That's to the great, next generation. Man. So when they get my age, they're going to be set. If exactly. there's a gig, if there's a pandemic, it won't matter because they got money in the bank and yeah. it's already set up. Yeah. So us, we're trying to figure out, like, pivot. I better do some live streams. I better do – I've done a, a couple master classes from here. Uh -huh. um, and I just charged – it was, like, I think $25 for wow. two hour. And I had, like, 30, 40 people. So That's incredible, if man. I did that once a week, I could probably pay some more bills. <laughs> so now we're <laughs> trying to pivot. Yeah. Not that I wouldn't do that anyway, <laughs> but I'm doing it because I got to pay my mortgage and I got to pay the rent here. And I got to – if I would have known to invest, I'd be sitting back now just like, mm. this is sad. But right. I'm good. Like, <laughs> all I'm you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. So that kind of thing is what I want to give to the next generation. That's like, great. think now. Like, I already had that set up. So when you're in your 40s, and 40s ain't old, old, but to a 19-year-old, <laughs> they think we're old. But if you start now at 19, just getting into either saving or that type of thing, yeah. then you'll be set by the time you're 40. It won't matter if a gig comes or not. Yeah. Man, you know. that's incredible. That's yeah. awesome. That's yeah. great advice. Thank you. What about relationships with endorsers? It's the same thing for me in terms of just being yourself. Don't go out your way trying to, because they see right through it. Um, and it's a funny thing. It's a whole big thing going on about endorsing these companies. And it's a whole black, white thing. And mm. it's like, look, if they're helping me out, I'm going to help them out. Because I'm actually endorsing their product. Yeah, People are buying stuff because they see me play it. Not trying to be egotistical, but a lot of young guys hit me like, yo, man. How was that Yamaha? I'm like, the Yamaha, to me, yeah. it's the best. Like, I'm not just saying that because we're on TV or because I'm in front of the— I'm, I really enjoy playing these drums yeah. musically. Um, and sticks, cymbals, everything. They just call me like, yo, what sticks do you use? What, what's your pedal? What's the—you know, and I tell them, and people go buy it because I'm like, yo, this is—I endorse it. Yeah. You know, so I'm helping them, and they're helping me by either giving me gear or giving me a discount on gear. 
it's a business transaction. Mm-hmm. It's nothing deeper than that, you know. So, and I try to look for people of color. Yeah. That have companies. I haven't been able to really find any. So, but these companies, in terms of companies, I tell people because people call me all the time over the years, like, "Yo, I'm doing a recording at my church. Um, you think I can get an endorsement?" And I tell them, like, "Look, this mm-hmm. is business." It's not that many people at your church. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Not trying to be funny, but the, it's a couple things. And this is one reason we're meeting with these companies. We want, we're want we advocating for diversity. So that's they great. have an A&R or somebody in the A&R department that's black or that's of color that can say, oh, no, that person is hot. Mm-hmm. Because if you're not that, you listen to it. If you listen to rock music, you're not going to know who the gospel greats right. are. You're not going to know who they are. Yeah. So somebody can call. And they're on every gospel record under the sun. But if that person doesn't listen to gospel music, they're not going to know who you are. So it's like, don't take it personal. Understand that these people in these companies are not necessarily listening to the style of music Hmm. we're listening to. One one year, I was talking to somebody at a, I'm not going to say the name of the company. And he was like, oh, who are you going out with? I'm like, I'm going out with Neil. And this is when his first album came out. He was big. The the tour we did was Chris Brown, Lil Wayne, Neo. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, and I was an MD for Neo, like, like, bro. And he didn't, he was like, oh, okay. Who's he that? didn't, he didn't even look, <laughs> you know, and to, to compare, to contrast that I was on the phone with Shore microphones and I was telling him the same thing. And he was like, oh, I don't know who that is. In mid sentence, he looked it up and was like, oh man, he's huge. Like, what do you need? You know what I'm saying? Wow. So I had to understand that they don't always know who we are. So go in it, uh, go in it, understanding that it's a business transaction. They're not going to give me stuff if they don't feel like I can help them sell stuff. Ultimately, the company is trying to sell something. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm not in a position to help them sell something, they're not going to want to give me nothing. So I don't take it personally. I just look at myself and like, I got to get a bigger gig. Yeah. So I want it so they're calling me, you know. So understand that it's a business transaction before you go hit them up. Understand that a lot of them, now they're looking at social media. At one point, they were reading the charts. Like if, if the artist you're playing with is like top 10 or whatever, they know that you're going to be out touring, that people yeah. are going to see their product because their end goal is to sell product, to make money. So understand that, go in it, go in it understanding that. I would tell people, to if you're doing TV or any kind of concerts in front of large crowds, always get video of you playing that mm. piece of instrument in front of lots of people because that's what they want. And that will help them, even if they don't know who you are or who the artist is, right. that'll help the company go, oh, man, this dude is really... So visual... Now they look at social media. So get your social media game up. Like me, I don't post a lot. But all my friends that post playing a lot have 100,000 followers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I got 13,000 followers. And I keep telling myself, I need to post more. Like when I'm cutting, because I cut every couple of days yeah. for somebody, I should just record myself cutting and yeah, get my definitely. YouTube up. Yeah. I forget because I be in work mode. Like, all right, let me knock <laughs> this out because I got to, you know. So get your social media up. Understand the business. And really wait till you get a big gig. Like, other thing is develop a relationship. What I tell people, two th- two things. For one, don't just get an endorsement to say that you have an endorsement because you're going to end up endorsing something that, that don't sound good or looks whack or doesn't. you don't like playing it. Whatever you like playing, stick to that yeah. and stick to that and just develop a relationship with them. So I'll introduce some people to some companies, and I'll be like, look, they're not going to give you nothing free right now. But just tell them who you are. Say, I enjoy your stuff. I don't mind. I'll buy a kit at a discounted rate. Yeah. Or can I buy a kit? Because now they know you. Now you're on their radar. And just keep working. Keep uh, stockpiling content, your yeah. videos, if you plan. If you're, And the more they see, they can be like, oh, wait, this dude is like. Legit. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. And I see people that on their first gig, if you get a first gig like Kendrick Lamar or like her that's playing with everybody, you're just in. They're yeah. just going to give you a deal. Right. But if you're not, they want to see that you're going to have a track record. I know yeah. some people at some companies like, yeah, that's cool. That That's a big tour. I'll send them some stuff. But I want to see his longevity. Is he just doing this tour and that's it? Because mm. I don't want to sign him to this deal and he does one big tour and then he don't play with nobody. <laughs> but he still wants free symbols. Yeah, one and done deal. Yeah, yeah no. Yeah. So some of them are like, no, I'm going to, you know. And I've seen them lose some real big guys because they didn't have that vision to see like, no, this dude's about to be. And they just said, I like them, but I'm just going to hold off on signing them right now. I'm just going to wait. Yeah. And they didn't want to wait, and they went and signed with another company. Man. So for me, it's like if I know what I want to play, I'm going to just – and most gigs now, if you're on a, a decent pop gig, they're going to get you whatever you want anyway. Right. Either rental 
I've had a gig pay for a drum set from me. Man. You know, they actually bought it, and it was my drum set when we were done. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> through, an endor- through an endorsement deal, through it, a discount. So they were dealing with me, but the people paid for it. Wow. So there's ways to do it. Just understand that you really need to have a high-level gig to really get set up with a big company, or they just, you know. And even with me, I'm looking at the companies like, they got Vinny, they got Weckle, they got Gad, Man. they got Dennis, they got Elvin, they got... So it's like, little old me, like, <laughs> how am I going to come in demanding some? I I really got to be worth, in their eyes, I got to be worth them giving me or, you know, giving me a discount. Yeah, yeah. You know, so That's- I would say stay focused and focus on the gig. Focus mm-hmm. on getting that gig and focus on the process of getting good at right. what you do. Right, You know, and even me, when I was in school, Gerald Hayward started playing with Guy and I saw him. He was doing Jay Leno and stuff with Keith Sweat and I've been knowing Gerald for a long time. And like Chris Dave started was already working. He he was just all even in college. He was playing with like Yolanda Adams and doing sessions and Kim Burrell, like all yep. he was. So, so I started getting frustrated because I was like, I know I could play. I feel like I'm ready. I'm playing a lot in DC, all over town. If somebody comes in town, they would. I would. I wanted to go on tour, and I finally got to the point where like, you know what? I'm gonna focus on graduating and getting better on the drum. I'm just gonna shed like every day for hours. And right at that, maybe a week later, Chris is like, you're going to have to go out with Shy. Like, it <laughs> fell in my lap. I didn't audition. He just said, you're going to have to go out with Shy. Yeah. So if you focus on the process and getting better, the gigs are going to come. You know, you got to put yourself in a place to be around people that's exactly. hiring. Yeah. But outside of that, if you focus on that, the stuff will fall in line. The endorsements and a whole nother, I, I can long-winded book. No, it's great, man. This is so good. When I was on tour, I was playing with um in 94 with Gerald and Layla. We opened up for Frankie Beverly and Maze. Ooh. And Michael White was a drummer with Maze, smacking. We were out for, I think, maybe two months, maybe, the summer of 94. And he played Pearl, and I played Pearl. And I was like, yo, man, you know, can you introduce me to the Pearl people? He was like, man, you're going to be all right. So my mom, <laughs> like, man, he hating, man. Why is he like, <laughs> why are you not hooking me up? Like, he's on the side of the stage because we're opening for them. Yeah. He would be on the side like, woo, like you're killing it. Like, why is he not hooking me up? He's like, you're going to be all right. And I thought he was hating. And years later, I realized what he was saying, like, you're not really ready yet in so many ways. Like, this is a cool gig, but it's not big enough for you to get. It's almost like wait for them to call you. Mm. And that's what happened. I was still playing. I started playing Pearl. And every every time I did a gig where they were renting backline from SIR, Center Stage, and yeah. I would just get a Pearl. And one day, the a r called me like, hey, man, this is such and such from Pearl Drums. Wow. You know, I'm interested in, you know, can we talk? And because they called me, I had more leverage to ask, well, yeah. I need this. Exactly. I need a kid. Exactly. I need this. You know, and I never signed a, a contract with any of the companies. It just, they all, somebody either referred me, like, you need to sign Gordon or, you know. Man. Yeah. And actually, actually, I thought about this too. Pearl had been hitting me up, but then another a the a that was there left. Another a came and Marvin Smitty Smith. We were at Baked Potato. We told He told the story the other day. Was like, yo, Gordon's right here. What you going to do? He put him on the spot. And they had already known, you know. So it came from that, too. Wow. But a lot of the stuff people kind of called me or one of my homies was like, you got to get Gordon. Like, he's playing with everybody, like, nonstop. And that's how it happened. So that's a better look than just sending a bunch of tapes yeah, in. Yeah, cold calling and trying to reach out on your own. And yeah. it can work. Yeah. If, yeah. You, if you stay on top of it. But if you focus on the work and getting the gig, and if you're working enough, they're gonna they're paying attention to who's on the gigs because yes. they want their gear on stage. Right, right. So if you're getting if you get the right gig, they're gonna call you. Yeah, that's good, man. Yeah. Can you list any memorable moments in your career? One good thing I think about me is I don't think about that stuff till after the fact. <laughs> when I'm in the moment, I just be in the moment. Yeah. Like even just moving to California, I just came out here. I'm, my whole family is basically in New York, and I just came out here. I didn't even think about it. And I have I have a couple cousins out here, and um, I went back home the summer. I mean, the, the winter of '94 for yeah. Thanksgiving, and one of my cousins had gotten married. So the whole family was there. They was like, "You all the way in California by yourself? Like you're not scared?" <laughs> and that's that's when it hit me. I was like, "Oh shoot!" Like, yeah, I do have a couple cousins, but if something really happened, my whole family's on the East Coast. It's like, so I think for me, I don't think about stuff even gig wise. So if I had to name one thing, the first thing that popped in my head, and it's funny because we had an inauguration yesterday. We played, when I was playing with Earth, Wind & Fire, we played Bill Clinton's last state dinner when he was leaving office. It was his last state dinner 
in the White House, well, on the grounds of the White House, you know, we were with Earth Wind, so they gave us yeah. the tour. The hotel we stayed in was like the presidential hotel. Wow. And Maurice White came, who is Earth Wind and Fire. Yeah. But when I was there, you know, he wasn't around anymore. But he was there. He's standing right on the side of the stage, like right on the drums. So I was a little nervous, like. That's Maurice. <laughs> yeah. So that was a moment that was like surreal. Like, yo, I'm at the White House and Maurice White, playing with Earth, Wind & Fire, and Maurice White is literally standing right there, like watching me play. Man. That was surreal. Yeah. So stuff like that. But most of the stuff, I just do it. And then I look back at it later like, yo, wow. I just played with George Duke for like 10 years. Yeah. Like, what happened? Like, I don't, I just kind of do it. So How was your experience like with George Duke? That was amazing. Because George, man, that's like one of my mentors. If you look in there, there's a picture of yeah, me I just saw with it. George. Yeah. Listen, George is so super cool. He's another person. I like variety. So like, like I said, with Marcus and Quincy, George has spanned every genre of music. He can play straight ahead. And a lot of people don't know because most of his albums is like more synth program based with the live band and stuff. But he can play straight ahead. If you listen to his old stuff, he was strictly a piano guy. And he did then, stuff with Zappa too? Then he Great. got with Zappa. Oh That's what gosh. I was going to say. He told me Zappa was the one that got him playing electronic keyboards. Because, you know, jazz purists is like, nah, I'm a piano player. Right, right. I play piano. Yeah. I don't play synthesizers and all that. Now, you know, back then, they weren't big like they are now. And he said Zappa's the one that got him playing like Whirlies and Rhodes and, and Moogs. Yeah, so George literally, any one of his shows... We'll play a straight ahead tune. We'll play like a gospel feel tune. We'll play like an African type tune. Then we'll go to the funk and play freaking um, Reach For It or something like <laughs> yeah. that. And then we'll do a Zappa tune that's in like 13 or something <laughs> in one show. Yeah. And he would always say like, get ready. I'm about to take you on a musical journey, like Man. through every style. And that's me. And that's my album. My album, yes. every song is just totally different from yes. the next. And he was just carefree. You know, I was able to play on his last album. He called me for two or three albums, but I would always, I would do George sometime. And then when the summer came, I would do a big pop tour, like the arena joints. Yeah. So he would call me, he called me for three of his last albums. And I did the last one because yeah. I was always on tour. Yeah. But um, I'm like, where's the click at? When we start, he, he was like, count it off. I'm like, where's the click? And all you hear is, and you couldn't see him because he was in another room. He was like, ain't no click. You the click. Count it off. <laughs> And that, he was like, man, I've been playing with clicks all all this time. I'm tired of that. I just want to feel. Yeah. And the biggest thing I learned from him was it's emotion and it's feel and it's, it's a spirit in the music. It's not technical. And that's what I got from him. All of this technical and it's got to be this. And he was like, man, just play. One song I played called Ashtray on, on it's called Dreamweaver album. He left the studio. It, it was nothing there. It was just like maybe a, a little bass line or something. And it was just me and Eric Zobler who mixed my album, Shameless Plug. He was George's engineer for like 30, 40 years. And he was like, I got to go to the post office. I'll be back. You, you know what to do. Just play and I'll build around you. He literally left me by myself with Man. the engineer. And I, I don't even know. I can't remember what the skeleton was that I played on. And now if you listen to the song Ashtray now, you'll hear it. it's all. He played everything. The bass, the synth bass, the horn. He did it all by himself. Wow. I think Jeff Lee Johnson played guitar. Okay. And that was it. So he was just like, Brian, just play, dude. Like. Even the first gig I did with him, I was subbing for Teddy Campbell because Teddy was doing it. And he was doing Britney. So he actually was like, can you sub? And I ended up just staying with George and Teddy got with Ricky and all that. Yeah. But um, the first gig rehearsal I did, I went to his house, brought kicks in their hat. We went over like two songs. I'm like ready to play like <laughs> the fusion stuff. And I have, he's like, man, you got it. I'll see you at the airport. We did like wow. two songs. He was so like, man, you Not got it. Nonchalant, yeah. 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 But the music was dope. And if it was whack, he would say something yeah. too. Like, you can't be whack. But it wasn't where I felt like, oh my God, I'm scared. I've been on gigs where I'm so tense because I want to play the beat and I just don't, it don't sound right. Yeah. And he made me made me feel comfortable and made me realize it's about the spirit. Like, if your spirit is good, you don't have to be the best player. Right. Best, that hump and that vibe is right. Yeah. That's yeah, everything. That's all you need. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I learned from him, you know, yeah. and just some some recording techniques and stuff like that. But Mainly, it's about that vibe, baby. It's yeah. like, that's it. Yeah, that's good. You recently yeah. came out with a new album, Conversations, right? Conversations. What inspired that? People telling me to do an album. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Seriously. I didn't want to do an album. I want to produce. Like, I'm a producer, you know? And a lot of people don't know because I've been playing drums more. Drums mm. just happened. And people kept calling. It was fast money. And I've always produced for yeah. so many years. 
I, I'm on a couple records, but I haven't had like a song that that just hit and everybody, mm-hmm. oh, you produced that? So even to this day, even with this studio, people still don't know that I'm an actual producer. Like I do vocals. Yep. I can do arrangements. Even the stuff marketing play. Now I arrange the horns. Man. I do horns. I do strings. I do, I can play the, in- I'm a producer. That's amazing. So I wanted to just stay home produce. I had a band called ENG Band with Ethan Farmer. That's the E and I'm the G, Gordon. And we had Eric Walls, Eddie Brown, Ooh. Regiment Horns. And then depending on the day, either Roland Garcia on percussion or Taku Hirano. Got it. So on percussion. And then a girl named, um, she goes by Apollo Jane. Denise Hudson was singing lead. So that was our band. We would play around town. So I was like, if I do an album, we doing a, a, a band album. Because Snarky had just come out. Um, Robert was already out. Glassboro doing his thing. And we have a mixture of Snarky, Robert, all yeah, of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, everybody was busy. Regiment was out with Justin Timberlake for like two years. Ethan was with Lionel and with everybody. Eddie Brown was out with Stevie on Songs of the Kid Life tour. Everybody was there. Eric Walls was out with everybody. So it was just like, and my friend who I talk to every day, one of my best friends, Sharice May, was like, you need to do an album. We would literally have arguments. Like, I don't want to be an artist. You should do an album. I don't want to be an artist. And we would literally like, hey, I'm going to call you back, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not being an artist. And then Paul Brown, who's another huge, smooth jazz producer, I do a lot of tracking for him. He came, we were in the room next door cutting, mm-hmm. and he came over here because I'm like, I can cut drums here, and he wanted to hear what it sounded like. So whatever song he played, I sat down on the piano, and I just started playing. He was like, wait a minute, play that again? And I started playing. You think you can do the, redo the piano on this song? He said, that sounds better than the they piano player I paid. to do." It. So I ended up playing bass, synth bass, piano, and live drums. Wow. So he lives down the street. He was, so I went to go pick up my check after I sent him the track. He said, you ever think about doing an album? He said, I'll play on it for free. Just call me. Because, you know, he's an artist, too. And, um, all right. And then two or three other people. Terrace Martin. Yes. Every time I saw him, he's like, bro, you need to do an album. Like, every time I see him at an yeah. event, bro, like, what are you doing? So I was like, all right, I'm going to do an album. You know, and that's where, that was the inspiration. People yelling at me. That's. Tell me to do an album. Who were some of the people you had on there? You had Sheila E. Sheila E., Oscar Cartaya. That that one song is called Song of Six. Sarah yeah. Reich, tap dancer. Yes. Um, Kamasi. Kamasi, Kamasi. Terrace Martin, Alex Isley, PJ Morton, BJ Chicago Kid, B. Slade. Man. Um, Gene Noble, Nika Hamilton, um, C-Town Horns. Yes. J-Mo on guitar, Jairus, um, Eric Walls, Roland Garcia, Taku Hirano, wow, Eddie Brown. Man. It's like everybody, Paul Jackson Jr., yeah, Peter Collins, uh, T.J. Wilkins. Who else? Did I say my daughter, Morgan Campbell? Not yet, but— Morgan Campbell, yeah. she's on a song where she's featured, but then she wrote on two other songs. Okay. So she wrote three of the songs, and she's singing. Um, who else? I think that might be it. Yeah. It's so many people yeah. that's connected, and like, that was that, yeah. How that long it. did this take? Like three years. <laughs> I looked it up. I started in 2016, so really four years. It oh came out gosh. 2020. Yeah. Yeah. So, and some of them were already done. It just money. Like, if I got to take a gig, I got to make sure I keep the lights on. Yeah. So I wasn't like sitting down just for a month where I wrote and then recorded it. No, I just did a song and it was organic. If I felt a, a energy that day, I just write it. Man. And most of my stuff came from hiking. If That's- you listen to my voice memos, all you hear is. Because <laughs> I'm walking in the dirt at Runyon Canyon. All my ideas would come. I'll be like, and I just sing it. And you hear, <laughs> you know what I'm Dang, saying? So that's cool. That's where I like clear my brain. A lot of times I won't listen to anything when I'm walking by myself. If I'm by myself, I just, and I just hear songs. Yeah. So I don't know if it just means sit down and shut up sometimes. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's where it kind of came from, and it was organic and different. The thing is, oh, I didn't name um, Eric Pick Funk Smith. He did a song that I did with B. Slade called Six in the Morning. Okay. And C-Town played on that song. Yeah. Man, dude. Dude, I love C-Town, man. Yeah, They're those great. are my dudes. They're those amazing, are my dudes. man. I met them playing with DW3. With Siono? And, yeah, 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 Siono told me he found them playing in front of a pizza place in West Covina. I was playing that gig. Really? I was playing that gig, <laughs> yeah. and Siono came because he's friends with the father of the artist that I was playing for, Anthony Alexander. Okay. And uh, so he showed up to his pizza joint in West Covina. Yeah. And so yeah. they had like a half-hour conversation. Really? And then we never saw him again. 
They stopped doing our gigs. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh, you never saw C-Town well, no, again? No, because every time we'd have a gig, they'd be busy doing something with Siona or DW3. Or... Spagatini's. Yeah, Spagatini's. So, and I fill in down there. I would fill in for either Streeter or Wallace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And who was playing drums. And I was like, who are they? Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. they were just parts. Like, and they had the... Some people have the chops and some people have the right. this or some people can... But it's a certain thing about a feel. Just yeah. know how to get that feel and playing together. And they had that just naturally. And yeah. I knew they were young, but I was like, they got a natural, good feel. Like, their I don't, timing's great, man. That's what I'm it's, saying. I yeah. don't have to tell them how to swing it. They right. just know how to swing it. Right. Some right. people, I have to go like, can you make it? They just got it naturally. Yeah. So I was like, "Yeah, it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. What advice would you give to the aspiring musician, those that want to get into the music industry, maybe trying to be a drummer, mm -hmm. could be a keyboard player, whatever instrument, what advice would you share with them? Number one, make sure you're seriously passionate about it because it's not easy. Like, and I, t I was telling somebody yesterday, my family, they think like I'm rich and famous because every time they see me, I'm on TV playing with somebody <laughs> yeah. famous. But I'm like, are you thinking about them three months that you didn't see me at all? Yeah. <laughs> it's sometimes, it's hard. It's not a steady check. Right. So you right. really got to be passionate. And that's why they always say broke musician or whatever, because you're going to be broke some days. You can surpass that. So have a passion and... Um, to make sure you really want to do it because it's yeah. not easy. It seems easy because you only see it in the good times. The other thing is study your craft, like really study music as a whole, study different genres, but study your instrument, like know it inside and out. Yeah. So there's never a gig that you can't get called for. Learn how to read is good because a lot of my friends don't read. They don't get the calls that I get for certain mm -hmm. sessions because they can't read. Yeah. So it's just like, you don't have to read to have a great career. Right. But if you do, it just adds more weight exactly. to you. And you can, it's certain gigs that, as in, I don't want it to ever be a gig that somebody wants me to play, but because I can't read or do something, they can't call me. Right. So I want to have every, you know, so learn how to read, know your history, learn your instrument, know the craft, be professional, be on time. And that's really it, man. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, if you're forget. a Christian, pay your tithes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah bro. It yeah. really works. Yeah. <laughs> it really no, I believe works. that. Definitely. Yeah. More than anything, that's a spiritual discipline, right? Yes. You yes. know, uh, to, to give back to your church. And yeah. obviously, God's going to honor that, you know, open yes. the, the windows of heaven, as they say. So uh, it, it really works. <laughs> Amen, bro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I mentioned the word value, what does that mean to you? Concerning what you do for a living, mm -hmm. how you value your time as a producer, drummer, what would you say? I think value is important it, from the way you're asking me. Yes, it's like it's serious because in this game, it's not a steady check. It's not like I get up, I go punch a time clock and I get paid every two weeks. If I don't value my time and what I'm doing, I'll be home broke. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like in, in order for me to be successful, I really got to prioritize and value yeah. Yeah. my time and myself. So there's two things to that. You know your value and you know your worth. And to some extent, the way you carry yourself is how you value yourself. And people see that, and they won't call you with no okie doke. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because they know, like, yo, you can. they can just see something that you don't have to say. They can just see, like, yeah, I can't call him for no whackness. But there's the other side. You can know your worth, and you can say, I'm worth a million dollars. But you also got to understand what people think you're worth. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because if they don't think you're worth a million dollars, they ain't giving you a million dollars. Right, right, right. So you got to find that middle ground. Yeah of what you feel like you're worth and what you will and will not take or will and will not do. And then you got to think of what they're going to give you and what's the highest they're going to give you. Yeah. So I don't always negotiate stuff. I just, it just depends on the feel in terms of taking a gig or not right. or production or not. But um, it's really, you got to value yourself, but understand what people, how they value you. And some people might not know who you are. They might not know your resume. Mm. You know, some people, I prefer that, you know, if mm. it's coming from production side. I don't want them to know I'm a drummer because they pigeonhole musicians right. and you can't produce. Any, so I don't even tell them. I, they'll come in here and see some, oh, you got drums. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. But yeah. outside of that, I don't tell them I'm a drummer Yeah, because it's like I want the value. They'll undervalue a musician. Mm. Uh, oh, okay, well, we can only pay you $2,000. I'm like, but I charge $5,000. You know what I'm saying? I'm just yeah. throwing out a random number. But, yeah, yeah. but value is important. And I think the more you value yourself and know your worth, like I said, people will see it and they'll approach you a certain way. Yeah, that's good, man. So you kind of cut out the BS. Right, right. You know, right. and it's never totally cut out, but you can help 
alleviate some Filter of the strain a little bit. Yeah, 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 by knowing your own and carrying yourself a certain way. Right. That's good, man. Mm-hmm. First of all, Gordon, thank you so much for your yep. time, man. Appreciate you lending the space. Where can we find you on social media? So album, Spotify, all that stuff. Yeah. So the album is called <laughs> Conversations. Yeah. Gordon Campbell, G O R D E N okay. Campbell. I'll D-E-N. put that in the description below as well. Yeah, Campbell. Yeah. Um, it's on iTunes, Apple Music, Spotify, all the social media, um, all the streaming platforms. Yeah. The best way to get it, if you want to buy it, is on Bandcamp. Okay. Because Bandcamp pays the highest um, percentage. They pay higher than Tidal, Spotify, yeah. Apple. Yeah. You know, and actually, my label, who I'm signed to, I got to shout out Rope Adult Records, Lewis Marks, Fabian, and Ben. Um, he's really trying to get us to just do band camp because yeah. they take care of the musicians the best. Even during the pandemic, they have days where they waive their fees. So whatever, if somebody That's amazing, pays $15, man. you get the full $15. Yeah. And I can sell merch on there. And it's a way of people of staying in touch personally with me. It's almost like a a, a Facebook page or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. They can email or leave a message and I'll see it. And once touring starts, that's where I'll be leaving. Like, all right, I'll be in Chicago at this place. If you're in Chicago, if you follow me on Bandcamp, you can keep up with me, basically. Yeah, that's great. So that's um, GordonCampbell.BandCamp.com. Okay. You can buy the record there. And it's a higher, um, uh, it's a higher, uh, what's the words? Not frequency. It's 28K. Okay. That's what I'm thinking. So it sounds better than if you got it on um iTunes or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because streaming, they got to compress it because right. it's so much stuff, so much information. But um, that, yeah, or you can hit me on my social media. I actually have CDs. So some people have been hitting me for like autograph CDs. <laughs> they just cash at me and I just give me their address and I mail it out. Nice. I'm doing six today. I got to send out. That's cool. So um, my social media, my main one that I'm on all the time is um, my Instagram, which is Gordon512. Okay. Instagram, G-O-R-D-E-N 512. Okay. I have a website that just got back up, so it's not a lot of stuff on there, gordoncampbell.com. So right. at least they can send me an email. And there'll be there's links to buy my album. There's links to my social media on GordonCampbell.com. Yeah. Um, what else? Um, Twitter, G Camp E N T. So G C A M P E N T on Twitter. Are Face- you on Facebook also? Yeah, Facebook. Okay. Gordon Campbell, and I have another page, Gordon E Campbell, my middle initial. Okay, and that's your your drummer page, or or like just producer page, or that's just my personal yeah. page. Okay. I just put everything on. Yeah. There. <laughs> there is a fan page that somebody set up. That goes through my Gordon Campbell, so they can hit me on there, too. Okay, got it. But yeah, just Gordon Campbell, and they'll, they'll cool. find it. All right. Yeah. Well, Gordon Campbell, thank you so right, much. Right. Yeah. <laughs> With an E, please. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, G-O-R-D-E, right? Thank and, you. D-E-N. Right. Yeah, Let's episode 37 with Gordon Campbell. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks thank you, Gordon. Me, bro. Appreciate it, man. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs>